morning. Good morning. Um, I am part of the new planning circle, which is, is an open circle. And uh, just here to welcome you. I, I love what I'm just hearing about this. You know, sometimes we have to leave and then we have, and then we want to return. There's like this place for us here in helping for helpers. And in this second year, things are staying the same and things are being invited into the circle and sometimes work pulls us away or family pulls us away or our health or whatever it is but there's this leaving and returning um and this ebb and flow that we're so glad you all keep continuing and leave and return so welcome today we're going to be uh having lynn facilitate the reflection about fighting the good fight. Um, and this will probably be a series. This is a first of um, a couple of things about anger and fighting and conflict, but fighting the good fight. How do we fight the good fight? And exploring how we use focusing uh, rather than that fight flee response, that reactive re response, but how do we use focusing in this way to fight the good fight? So here we are. Thank you, Lynn. Welcome, welcome. What do you think of starting early Monday morning after uh, a weekend talking about anger? Are you up for that? Mm -hmm. I, I imagine some of you saying, oh, no, you know, I came to this group to be nourished and, and um, calmed from my hectic life and, uh, and soothed from all of the problems. And, and Lynn is going to make us talk about fighting and anger. <laughs> well, I, I have to say that um, it, it feels like bad timing in a way, because this is our very first um, official meeting of our second year. And we don't want to start off the second year with anger. But in another way, it's, it's the right time. Uh, last week, at the, at the end, someone said, and it might have been Trevor, I forget. But someone said, well, the small groups are easier because I could bring negative feelings to the small groups, but I can't bring anything like an angry feeling to the large group. And I thought about that and I thought, yes, I mean, that we, we feel we have to bring our best selves. And of course we do bring our struggles, but a sense that that person, uh, and if you're here who said it, maybe you can say it better. I, I, may, be, uh, I may be getting it wrong. Um, but that, that the conflict, the anger, the fighting energy can't be welcome in a large group in this community. And as we are entering our second year and we're a more mature community now and we want to we want to emphasize the um the communal nature of our gathering that we're not just here to um you know to to hear uh someone else speak we're here to reflect together on what matters to us on being human, on being focusers, and to see what focusing has to bring all of these aspects of life. And so um, I, I thought about, well, what is a good fight? You know, what is a good fight? But then as I was really thinking about it, um, anger has to be dealt with first. So then I thought maybe we'll have a series. So um, I'm not gonna talk about the good fight so much this morning. I'm going to talk about anger. And then next time I'll talk about 
conflict. And then and the time after that, uh, I don't mean all in a row. Sometime this year, I'll talk about um, the good fight. So those are all my disclaimers here. I settling into such a complex, what can I say in 15 minutes about anger? Oh my, anger is so necessary to our being human. And it's such a nemesis, right? It's anger is, is needed for survival for carrying forward. And yet it's so difficult. It's so troublesome. It's so, um, it's never right. Have you noticed that, that, there's, that there's an idea that if you're really, um, you know, a good therapist, a good focuser, a good person, a good meditator, mature, you know, that you really, that that you really get anger and have it right. And that you could receive anger and you could express anger in a way that's a really good way. And then you feel like, what's wrong with me? I didn't do it right. I have an anger problem. Either I'm too angry or I'm not angry enough. And then when somebody is expressing anger to us, it's like, oh, they didn't do it right. It was too much. It was explosive. Or they would beat around the bush. They didn't get to the point. It was too soon. Or they waited and waited and it was too late. It was too hard. It was too soft. It's never right, right? I mean, every once in a while, you could have an experience of somebody expressing anger to you or you're expressing anger to somebody else and it, and it feels right. And often, if you work at it, it becomes right. There's, there's um, a wonderful um, expression that Gene has when he's talking about receiving anger from his clients. And, and he's, he, he calls it the, um, the out-o phenomenon, that his first response when his client is angry at him is go, <gasps> oh! And then he thinks, oh, the client is getting stronger. The client has something to say. The client is being active. The client, oh! And I wonder if we all always have that <gasps> either when you're angry or when another person is angry, there's always that ouch involved. And um, Gene's a wonderful model because he can go from <gasps> to oh, some, of, some of us, it takes weeks. Some of us, it takes a lifetime or many lifetimes to get to the Ooh, the O oh part. We never get through the ouch part. And I think that Jean was saying there that the ouch is our, our human experience. And you notice that I keep saying, you know, that it's anger directed toward us or, or us toward the other. And it's also anger that we have toward ourselves, the different parts of ourselves that can become angry at each other. And there's always that ouch quality to it. So what can I tell you in 15 minutes that can be helpful? I think that, that it isn't my intent to really give you a talk about anger so much as to bring up the subject so that it can be um, speakable because many times it's not speakable. 
Another, another little instance that I love with Gene is when he said to the client, we're like this right now. Do you remember that? Those of you who read Gene's stuff, it's such a beautiful, uh, a beautiful expression because it acknowledges the anger. It doesn't make it hierarchical. Either you're angry at me, you have to express your anger, or I'm angry at you, you're not being a good, a good client, or there's something wrong with you. Um, that we are like this right now. And we could do a whole talk about that. Can you show your hand, Lynn? I don't see. Oh, we are like this right now, he says to the client. I think that's a wonderful thing to say or to feel or to just acknowledge we are like this right now or whatever way we are, maybe we're like this, maybe we're like what, but it's a we and there's, and there's an experience here that we need to acknowledge and then we can respond to it. So my intent is that we reflect together about that experience that ultimately human experience of anger that's so needed and so problematic and so complex uh, and that we can respond to it together and share our wisdom. So I'm going to start and then uh, and then we we want your your wisdom about it. So I'm sharing some things that I've learned about it and then we'll see what um, what comes to you about it. I think that um, a peaceful life is not a life devoid of anger. A peaceful life, is a life in which the experience of anger can be a challenge that is taken up and carried forward. That anger that is experienced as destructive often and, and sometimes is, uh, there's a constructive energy at the base of it, all human experience has implicit um, inherent forward movement in it. And so we want to get to what is trying to come in the anger rather than getting stuck in the anger. Um, I am have always been sort of a natural pacifist and um, and I don't like, I don't like conflict. I don't like anger. I don't like war. I don't like fighting. I don't like any of those things. I like everybody to be loving and, and nice since I was a little kid, always trying to make people bring the family together, right? Bring the factions of the family together. But what I've learned in my life is that you cannot make peace by avoiding anger. It doesn't work. That to make peace and to make peace is maybe one of the highest callings of every human being. To, to just think about that. That we all have the ability to create, to make. It's something that we make. To make peace. Wow. I mean, what an amazing calling that is. And we have to learn to respond to anger in order to make peace, including within ourselves. We can't have equanimity and, um, and peacefulness in ourselves by avoiding the angry feelings, the offended feelings, the hurt feelings, the frustrated feelings, the judgmental feelings. The, I could go on and on and on, right? 
we need to be able to respond to those feelings in ourselves and in others in some way <clears throat> that brings the forward movement of the constructiveness that the organism really wants, brings that into the picture. So anger is not the enemy, but we all know that anger, when it isn't expressed, it turns into, or it morphs into, or flows into hopelessness, depression, resentment, self-criticism, lack of, of juiciness, um, uh, what we call acting out or manipulating or I mean all kinds of things right when we when we when we suppress that and we uh, repress it and ignore it and eschew it it does all kinds of damage under there and when we just pour it out and um, express it all over the place right? We make a big mess. And then sometimes the mess that's made by just, you know, getting it out, getting it off your chest, that big mess sometimes uh, isn't able to be cleaned up for a long time. Sometimes those messes never get cleaned up. In our society or our many societies here in this group, Sometimes those feuds, those messes just go on and on and on and on and on. And the stuck anger, either stuck, repressed or suppressed or stuck in its, in its um, overflowing becomes cyclical causing more and more damage. So we, we all know that, we all know that there needs to be another way. And we, many of us think that everybody else knows the better way and we don't, but that there are these people that know the better way. I actually only knew one person who liked anger and she, and she was my group supervisor and she loved the energy of anger. She loved it when people were angry at her. She loved it when she was angry or anybody in the group. Jim, you would have loved this woman. She was a woman made for Jim. Um, she, but, but unfortunately, she was the only person <laughs> that I, I knew. And, and I loved that she loved anger. But I never quite got the taste for it. It's like an acquired taste that I never, I never acquired. But I loved it. She loved it. Um, but the, the, those people are very, very rare. And actually, I don't know if her husband loved it. We don't know about that. <laughs> so anger is not the enemy. But, but as Gene, in his wonderful paper that I think Susan Dysroth may give us a talk on the fitting in, pouring out, and relating that sometimes we try to fit in by not dealing with our anger. And sometimes we pour out and, um, and make a mess. And the relating to anger is the most complex, the, the, the greatest challenge I think that we have as societies and, and as individuals and, and as individual psyches within us. So I'm going to try to capture a couple of things that I've learned about it. But let's take a breath as we get ready to think about anger together. Ah, uh, maybe we need two breaths there. Maybe you 
can take a step to allow in this moment, in the safety of this group, a little taste of your own anger or the anger of someone important to you who's angry at you. Just let that be there as we're talking, just that little taste. Don't want to fall into it. And we don't want to be so intellectual and far away from it that we're just uh, thinking about it abstractly, but just have a little taste of that there. So one thing that I want to share that some of you therapists know about is, is Kohut's distinction He's the founder of self-psychology between what he called anger and what he called narcissistic rage. And I know that's a very off-putting term, but I couldn't think of a better term. Maybe you people can help me think of a better one. Anger is a feeling like every other feeling that, um, that points to something that's a signal that the energy of activates us, that we can listen to and find an action there, something needed. We can think of, of protest movements like Black Lives Matter, where anger is pointing at some action that's needed. We can think of in our own lives of times that we're angry, maybe even just angry at our dog, if Melinda's dog um, is not always a perfect puppy, or at our children, or at our clients, or at um, our spouses, or uh, neighbors, or friends, or um, you know, that there is a kind of anger that we all know that's a signal of something. And then the second kind of anger that <clears throat> Kohut called narcissistic rage, and he revitalized um, the word narcissism as, as, a, as, as a kind of self, the, the, the deep self is, what he called narcissistic and narcissistic rage is when when the sense of self has been hurt and there's a rage that comes with a feeling of disintegration and um koha talked about that rage as a disintegration byproduct, and I love that, a disintegration byproduct when we feel that kind of rage of a hurt to the self. And Kohut said that narcissistic rage is an experience of, get these words, endless hatred and lust for revenge. Endless hatred and lust for revenge. I remember once uh, one, of my, one of my clients kept going around in circles every time with the, with the same anger and offense and um, it, no matter how much she expressed it, it couldn't be expressed. It couldn't be moved. And uh, I always avoid giving, you know, I always avoid um, uh, talking um, theoretically to my clients. But I, I said to her at one point, you know, somebody called that an experience of endless hatred and lust for revenge. And she said, yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. Yes, it's endless. I lust for revenge. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a turning point, you know, in our therapy because 
those words really uh, matched her experience. And, um, you know, people talk about how the, the, the Nazis w w experienced narcissistic rage and the, the killing six million Jews was not enough, you know, because the, the feeling is that you have to get self-esteem back and that it that revenge is going to do it, but revenge doesn't do it. There has to be more and more revenge because something has been damaged in you. So I think, you know, we could think about that theoretically or professionally, but we all know that experience, right? I mean, maybe we don't kill people. Uh, literally maybe we kill them off in our minds maybe we kill them in little ways but we all know the experience of that feeling of being falling apart inside in some kind of way with the feeling of self-esteem being damaged and shame somewhere in there and that's that shame blame cycle that gets started and we all know that feeling of the, it might just be even a moment of the endless hatred and lust for revenge that just wells up in us. So the reason that this distinction is so important is that anger that is a signal, it's very important in ourselves or in others to listen to the content. What is it signaling? Uh, the details may be important. Whereas uh, the rage, the kind of rage that Kohut is talking about, maybe it's not the content. Something has been hurt. And the person may be saying all kinds of things that they, they don't, they're, larger selves don't mean in any way. And the content isn't the thing to listen to, it's to listen to the hurt. And I'm, I, I don't think that these are quite so distinct as Kohut made them because there may be rage in the, in the anger and anger and the rage. But, um, but I do think it's important that um, if somebody is getting something off their chest, it's, it's often something is triggered and it isn't essentially about us. And to take it in as, oh, it's something about me, isn't helpful to the person or to ourselves. The rage needs to be healed. It needs to be soothed. It needs, it's a state. Whereas anger needs to be engaged. So just put that somewhere and see if that's helpful to you. So Winnicott, I'm gonna bring in one more um, psychoanalyst, talks about how relating to anger is to not retaliate and not collapse. We don't want to simply fit in or pour out. We don't want to retaliate or collapse. But what do we do with it? What the hell do we do with this experience? It's fine to say, don't do this and don't do that. What do we do? So um, I'm going to give you a, a few thoughts about it. And I realize that we need to, to, to reflect together here. The first thought um, is that we listen to anger. And that's the hardest thing to do. The hardest thing, anything that we do that's really relating rather than fitting in or pouring out is very difficult to bear it, to stand with it, to feel that we're angry with the person rather than angry against, that we're 
the fighting energy of anger is fighting for, not fighting against. So the first principle or something is not to be in a fight with the fight. Not to be in a fight with the fighting energy in ourselves or in the other. To listen, to listen to the anger. And to get to the point of listening, we need to, sometimes we need to, to be with the ouch before we can go with the oh, right? So the, we might need um, a moment for ourselves to just, <gasps> and, um, or we may need much more than a moment. We may need, uh, I can't talk about this right now. I'll come back to it. Um, or we might need to um, pour out before we can relate in, in genes, fitting in, pouring out and relating. And we want to pour out maybe to a focusing partner or um, in some way that's not going to do damage before we can listen. So that may be the case. That's a very tricky part is to, is to really acknowledge the ouch. Acknowledge our own ouch. And then get to pause and to be able to listen. When we listen to anger, we're listening to the deeper point of it. Right? We're listening to the implicit of it. We're listening to, to what it has to say, where it's trying to go, what it's trying to do. And when you can do that, you should feel so, or you should feel, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that we can all feel so satisfied. I could listen to, to this. It's such a human challenge. I could listen. I could survive. I could stand here. I could be here with this. So that's the first pointer. Focusing can help us listen. The second one is that the nature of anger and conflict is that it simplifies. When we're in, a, in danger, um, there's fight or flight. There's no room for the complexity of human living in that instinctual basic part of our being. We simplify everything to who's right and who's wrong. Should I fight or should I flee? Um, who did what to whom? And in that simplification, if we're running away from a lion or, or in New York, running away from, you know, from somebody that's gonna rob us or something like that, the, the fight or flight uh, instinct is very important there. But, um, but in, in our usual circumstances, we need to recomplexify after the anger has simplified. So we need to um, question that right or wrong, us or them, fight or flight, and say, well, what, what's in that anger? What kind of anger is there? There's a million kinds of anger, frustration, uh, annoyance, um, hurt, pissed offness. I mean, we have to find just the way, that's the particularity of that anger. Recomplexify all that's in it. And part of the recomplexifying is the sense that it isn't um, a, a me against you 
it's an us that there's a kind of um, that there's an experience that we we are interaction, as Jean says, and there's an experience of usness. So we can say, you know, what is this for us? What is this for me? What is this for the other? What is this for us? Like Jean said, we are like this right now. How are we like right now? How are, as a society, how are we? What, what is this us, the experience of the polarization of us? What is that? So it's the re-complexification of focus that focusing does. And the third, um, the third uh, point that I want to make is that, um, that we can make it a something. And we all know Anne Weiser Cornell has really um, uh, done a lot of teaching about this. The idea of saying, I'm angry with you is very different than something in me. That little move of saying, it's not all of me, it's not all of the other person, it's not all of our society. Um, it's something, it's a something. And that helps us to, to recognize the larger me that has the anger or that's uh, suffering the anger of someone else who's angry at me. And that it's not all of me or all of them. It's a something. And that gives us a little courage to be interested or curious or have faith in that um, deep forward moving energy that's in everything, it's in life and it's in those, in the anger too, right? There's something and that brings the forward movement. And I could say so much more, but I, I'm going to give us one more breath and then I want to hear what comes to you about the subject. And maybe I'll send you some notes of other things that I didn't get a chance to say. <sighs> so I'm so curious about what's there for you now. including I'm so angry with you, Lynn, for bringing up this topic when I was just enjoying my tea and looking out the window. I find that um, what you said about listening simplifies. I had never thought of anger that way um, because anger feels so red and big and um, takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So when you say that listening simplifies, it actually puts it in a completely different frame to be addressed. It, um, it gives it a different shape. And, I, and I, I really, I have to think about it a little more, but it, it just, it makes, more sense, it, it's manageable. You, it, it's something that you can manage. Most of the time, anger feels unmanageable. Yeah. Too big, too large, too red, too uh, beyond. Yeah. And when you say simplifies, it brings it down to the core of how to address something that seems so unmanageable. Um, so that, that I think is a really um, great way to address it. Um, I, I love what you're saying because you're saying the opposite of what I said and it's very true. I love that. I was saying that, that anger, uh, that the anger simplifies the situation 
that when we're angry. Oh, you're right. Uh, you're right. The anger, you know, that's what I meant. That the anger simplifies. What you but, just said is right too. Let, let's just play with it. Okay. All right. Because I wrote in my notes, listen and simplifies. And I, I think what I did was con converge them. But that was, that, that was your implicit wisdom there, right? <laughs> well, I'll take credit for that. But. Um, the, the idea that, that anger, and, and uh, this, uh, there's a book on, on this by uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, Doris Brothers, who writes about how um, uh, anger and conflict um, and uh, trauma simplifies everything into a, a me against you, a right and a wrong. Yes. And that then focusing helps us to bring in the complexity that's been lost. But what you're saying, Lynn, your unconscious is saying, your implicit is saying is also right that focusing helps us to take this unmanageable complexity and to, to narrow it down to what's called for here mm. and simplifies too. Isn't it interesting that it can, that, that both, both those things are, you know, are uh, in our experience, both of them are true. Thank you. You're welcome, side by side. I think what I really like about the concept of it being a something mm -hmm. is that it brings in the detachment that I don't have in the moment. It allows me to kind of put it separately from what's going on. Exactly. That, that when we say it's a something, it's not all of everything. It's not all of me. And, and that's so... Um, it's so ubiquitous, that feeling that it's everything. Mm -hmm. And that if somebody's angry at me, oh, I am just horrible. I'm nothing. I'm, you know, whatever. Um, but, or the other person is, is never has been a real friend to me. And, you know, uh, and they've always been this way and that way. And they are this way and that way, right? So the, the something brings the right distance. Mm -hmm. That's, as we know in focusing, the, the key element of the right distance where we're not uh, drowning in it and we're not uh, pushing it away. I think um, one of the things that, one of the things that really stood out that you said Lynn was when you said revenge never gets self-esteem back mm. um, because there's something in you has been damaged and I don't know that really spoke to me um, because it it speaks to the the obsession with blame mm. and you're always stuck when you're in blame when you're in revenge when you're in blame you never turn it around and self-reflect. Right. And that just really spoke to me and right. my experience. Right. That, that shame, blame game. And we, we see that so, uh, so um, vividly with, with gangs, with um, youth gangs that are uh, murdering each other to get, you know, to, to get revenge. And then the next, then that gang has to murder somebody to get revenge. Uh, and we, we murder each other in the shame blame game inside ourselves or uh, verbally um, you know, all the time or all the time. Let's not say all the time, but it's certainly in our culture. This is a uh, Brigitte bowing in. Yes. You see me well? All right. Okay. So I went to so many places during uh, Lynn's sharing. And uh, um, regarding the, the, uh, the little sentence that opens up the, the stuckness or the narrowness of the anger, uh, a teacher of me told me to say, 
my mind is telling me that. Mm -hmm. And I find it so helpful when I cannot go, uh, something in me, no, <laughs> my mind is telling me that I cannot do the focusing way, for example. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's so funny. And uh, also, uh, I went into the preciousness of nonviolent communication, where yeah. we learn to go right away into the needs and to really feel that the needs of the other person need to matter as much as mine. Yeah. And that's a stretch. And, if a stretch. In stretch. and in the stretch, we can go into focusing. Yeah. Um, and the third thing that I noted is the, uh, the difference between the Western world and the Eastern world or Buddhism and uh, uh, the uh, more the uh, European traditions is that um, Buddha talked about upeksha, um, anger, uh, no, uh, equanimity. And uh, it, it was translated by many uh, uh, translator um, by equanimity. Upeksha. But uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, in his wisdom, translated it into inclusivity. Mm. He said that was a mistake to say equanimity, inclusivity, inclusivity of everything, of everyone. And when I heard him say that, I went, ah, oh, yeah. Mm. Because wow. equanimity, it, how do you do equanimity, for goodness sake, when I have this and I am there like that? Uh, but it, I can I can put my arms like that. Um, yes. So um, let's see. And uh, also another, uh, I hope you don't mind, <laughs> and another um, teaching uh, of the second arrow, when uh, there is a fire, we send uh, we, we we send the firefighters. We don't run after the the arsonists. And uh, in the Western world, we have a tendency to go to the <laughs> to the arsonist, right? And so uh, there is the teaching of the um, of the antidote. If I train myself when I have anger, I have to cultivate love, compassion, and patience then I don't go into the second arrow. I, I just stay. I, I, uh, uh, I uh, you know, I have the menu. <laughs> I, can pick from. I can go back to myself and say, oh, which teaching can I use? Right, right. So that's all, but all the systems that I have in me. So just yeah. want to take care of that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the, those are, are beautiful. Um, elaborations of what we're talking about here. And I wanna share with you uh, a couple of little sayings that, uh, that come to me about it. The, one is a bumper sticker that I saw that I, that I often quote, and, and the bumper sticker said, I don't believe everything I think. And that's like my mind, I don't believe everything my mind tells me, right? I don't believe everything I think. And, and uh, I loved your example of um, the fire. Uh, you put out the fire and that's what needs to happen with narcissistic rage, right? That it, it starts a fire. And then if you just blame the person that started the fire, the fire needs to be put out. The fire needs to be smothered, softened, helped, healed. Uh, not the north, the, not the uh, arsonist being punished. Um, I mean that that's not the first thing we do. Um, and the other the other thing that comes to my mind is this edict about strike while the iron is cold. I love that one. When the iron is hot, that's not the time to engage the anger. And it might even just be a breath to cool down the, the, the fire, to strike while the iron is cold. The, the fire, right, in the indigenous healing traditions is of course one of the elements of which we are all made, right? Steph was talking about the something, right? 
and you know something in us right feels fiery you know and so whether it's ayurveda or chinese medicine the fire is the vitality right we are all on the earth you know born from the sun which is fire the earth has fire at its core and fire in the the healing arts systems is associated with metabolism with the ability to process food it's vitality right and so what anger is you know it's a result of thwarted will right and so then rather so the the, the issue from a healing arts perspective in terms of physical healing arts is not to put out the fire and dampen the fire it's to help the fire move more appropriately like a fire in the woods right you add you put stones around it can contain it the automobile it's a controlled explosion it gets us where we want to go so so the the looking at somebody's fire and our own fire is a something that we kind of like kind of bring inquiry in uh mm -hmm. Right, the energy, um, making a place for the energy of, of anger and the bodily felt sense of anger and see, trying to make uh, friends with it. Like, oh, that's there. And that's very hard, very difficult, but I can do it with my focusing, right? I can breathe, I can have company, I can find support, I can find healing for my wounded self-esteem. I can see what the complexity is. So I'm, I'm going to lead you in a very short attunement. So let's take a breath. Give ourselves a moment for the stillness that needs to balance the anger, the energy of anger. And the feeling like it's hard, but I can find a place to anger right now. I can be friended. Or if I can't, I can befriend the feeling of not befriending it, right? I don't have to fight with the fighting. I can find a place. And then see some little incident, maybe not the largest anger of your life right now, because we all have those, the deep, deep angers that we carry. Not the biggest one, but something that's present. And just see for a moment what is in that, like looking in a pond, and seeing what's in that anger. Is it helplessness, hurt, frustration? Betrayal? Inadequacy? But just let, let that re-complexification happen as you feel into the right word for that experience that you're having, that you're accessing in this moment. And see if there's an image. And maybe if you have a pen handy or a phone, you know, write that down. The name of this particular particular kind of angry experience that you're allowing in this moment.
making that a something. Like, oh, let's pick this rock up and look at its contours, see what's there, what it's made of. And hold it together. And then just see if there's anything that we've said so far that helps. And this will be an open question. We won't be able to answer that fully right now, but just to have that question open. Now, what will help there? How can I relate to this rather than stuffing it down or pouring it out. What can help? Is there anything that we've said that touches it? And if something comes, just write that down also. know that we can come back to this. We're not going to complete that process now, but we can come back to it in the future. And when you're ready, rejoin the group and just look at everybody. Oh, here you all are. Here are my companions here. Here we are together dealing with one of the hardest things that humans ever have to deal with. We're doing it together, making a place for it in our community. So, who is ready to share anything that uh, came for you? Anything you want to share? I love what you said about there's a constructive energy at the base of anger. Mm. And I think this, you know, too much, too little, there's like first that flurry, that red, that anger, but it's this deconstruction or, you know, sort of shaking things up that the anger allows or we allow ourselves to kind of slow down to be curious mm. sort of hold on to the root of the anger but mm. in a curious way to allow enough space for what is constructive yes what is the energy that's constructive in all this Yes, yes, a wonderful focusing question. What can be constructive here? But often we have to get through the, the ouch part before we can get there. So we need to not expect ourselves to get there right away. Because then you could sort of get overwhelmed with that task and start defending yourself and, you know, all of that that we need to do when we're hurt. But what you're saying, uh, Beth, also reminds me about uh, the idea and complexity theory of a perturbation of a system, that systems need perturbation, that there's a kind of tipping point between chaos and rigidity. And when the system is too chaotic or too rigidified, something needs to break in there. And anger is sort of like that, a perturbation of the system. And it's meant to help the system to um, self-regulate. There's a question of safety. Um, mm. So it's interesting because um, when I was focusing on a small, on a small anger moment, on a particular moment, what, what, what 
can help at that moment what can help is not to be left alone mm. not to be blamed not to be shamed yes. something that can be there that can that will not get destroyed by it yes like, yeah. and i was saying in my little group like the mama bear you know yeah her kid but when you are grown up and a big adult or a big man or whatever you know it's like how, how so if i turn it around like how can i find safety so that i can meet and mm. there and hold it and mm. often it's not you know sometimes it doesn't want to be smothered it, it needs space mm. Mm-hmm. But it needs somebody there, or it needs like somebody yes. else was saying, and I was saying something to return, like, okay, not now, but we will return. Yes. Do not be abandoned there because yes. he's saying it's a human experience and it's needed and it shakes things up. Yes. And it can be very constructive. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's so beautiful what you said there, Sophie. That to find safety, we need to be supported and not abandoned there, not left alone, not feeling blamed or shamed. I love that image of the mama bear. We need a mama bear to help us, to keep it company. And sometimes, even the ideas can be that mama bear to remember i don't have to believe everything i think or to remember this isn't all of me or um whatever the the anchor is but uh, another person is is whether it's another person inside us or another person outside us that we can speak to is is the safety. Safety is such an important part of this. Thank you. You know, I think that many of us who who know focusing really get the difference between asking uh, the explicit what can help. Nothing can help. He's always like that, you know, uh, to asking inside what can help here. It's a whole different ball game when we ask the implicit rather than the explicit question. And what comes may not make any sense. It's not a logical what can help. It's, it's deeper than that, bigger than that. Okay. Uh, it's time for Dorothy's poem. I just want to say uh, in our new, adding new voices, if you would want to greet people and be a, a welcomer at the beginning, uh, email us and let us know that you would do that. It's just a one minute greeting. So that we have other voices greeting people rather than only Melinda and me. Okay, Dorothy, you're on. Okay. Um, The poem um, today is by David White, W-H-Y-T-E. He's um, English, Irish. His mother was Irish, his uh, father from Yorkshire. Um, And um, I was um, fortunate to um, go to the Open Center about 20 years ago and hear him. And and I'm so happy that Frida um, reminded me of him. Um, recently. And the poem I'd like to read today, I think speaks to what Sophie was saying about not being alone with one's anger or any of our emotions and how important that is. Um, And he does something that's beautiful that he repeats his lines. It's it's a very special way he presents. Um, Everything is waiting for you. Your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone. As if life were a progressive and 
cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely even you at times have felt the grand array, the swelling presence and the chorus crowding out your solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you or the window latch grants you freedom. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone to your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even if it pours you a drink, even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything is waiting for you. Everything is waiting for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And now we can all unmute ourselves and say goodbye. And yeah. Death, I believe, is our uh, reflector of giving the reflection for next week. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. <laughs> and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Blessed everyone. Day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Hard to say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Hard to say goodbye. Yes. Once again. Bye bye. Be well. Be well. <laughs> bye -bye. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn. It was very helpful. Oh, good. Yeah. good. Wonderful. Good. So much. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs> Dorothy for the beautiful poem. <laughs>